your favorite story about the two venues involved, Fenway Park and, and Dodger Stadium. Take your pick if you want to go through your mental Rolodex of uh, wow. where you you just have this certain memory of Fenway and a certain memory of Dodger Stadium, two of the older venues in a league where everybody's got their brand spanking new stadium with luxury suites and boxes, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. This, is a neat, this is a neat world. Well, the Dodger Classic Stadium matchup. one is easy for me because I was part of the broadcast team in game one in 1988, and I was in the corner of the Dodger dugout when Kirk Gibson hit his home run. I was ready to jump out on the field and interview somebody, no matter the outcome of the game. And I saw Gibson come limping up the tunnel uh, and enter the, enter the dugout when no one expected him to play. He wasn't even introduced before the game. He wasn't even in uniform. He was on the trainer's table until late in the game. So I saw that whole thing unfold, and I think most people still view that as one of the most dramatic, almost theatrical moments in baseball history. So I've had to pick one Dodger Stadium moment. It would be game one in 1988. Well, let me dive a little At- bit more into that, though. So you're in the, you're in the dugout um you you're listening to the broadcast you're here in Vin and all of a sudden you look and you suddenly see Gibson in uniform and you saw that not it not exactly here's here's the way it happened back then i mean it seems almost quaint back then broadcasters were not allowed to be in the dugout during the game mm-hmm. now everybody's mic they do in-game interviews That's with right. managers and and players and whatnot but then technically i was breaking the rules but I didn't want to be hiding in the tunnel and not be able to see the game. So I sneak to the very edge of the dugout, and I'm perched there, and Lasorda sees me. And I always knew with Tommy, none of this had any malice. It's just who Tommy was. So Tommy starts screaming to his guys, look, it's bleeping Costas. Even bleeping NBC thinks the bleeping game is over. They don't give us any bleeping chance. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to suppress my laughter, but they, they like me well enough to let me stay there, even though I was breaking the rules. So now I hear, this is like in the eighth inning, I hear a sound from down the tunnel where there's a batting cage. So I walk down to investigate, and there is Gibson with a ball boy who is putting balls on a tee, and he's hitting balls off the tee, and he's grunting in pain with each swing. And it's at that point that I get on the IFB to Mike Weissman Mm -hmm. and John Filippelli in the truck, and I say, let Vin and Joe know that Gibson has put his uniform on. He's taking practice swings. I don't know what that means, but I guess he could pinch hit. And that's what happened. Oh, So what about your Fenway memory? (sighs) You know... I wasn't there. I was watching on TV, mm-hmm. but the Carlton Fisk home run in 1975 is still uh, an extraordinary Fenway moment. Uh, the Dave Roberts stolen base and what it led to uh, in 2004 when they were on the brink of defeat against the seemingly invincible Mariano Rivera and what that led to. And Roberts himself tells a very interesting story. He wears number 30 in honor of Maury Wills, a great Dodger of uh, the 1960s era with Koufax and and Drysdale and that team. Uh, And for a while, he held the record until it was broken by Lou Brock and then Ricky Henderson. He held the record with 104 stolen bases in the 1962 season. He broke Ty Cobb's longstanding record. And Maury Wills said something to Dave Roberts early in Dave's career that every great base dealer that I have known has confirmed for me. The real test isn't when there's an element of surprise. The real test is when everyone in the ballpark knows that you have to steal this base, (laughs) and you still got the guts to do it. And Robert said that Maury Will's voice was in his head when Terry Francona sent him out to pinch run um, in the ninth inning. And he knew he had to go on the first pitch, that he couldn't waste any time. He did. And he was safe by an eyelash. Posada's throw was good. Jeter's tag was good. He was safe by an eyelash. Even if they'd had replay, he still would have been confirmed as safe. And it's interesting that he never appeared in the World Series. He never had an at-bat. He did pinch run in the next game. But those were the only appearances he had for the Red Sox in that postseason. He'd been traded from the Dodgers at midseason. And then in the offseason, he was traded to San Diego. So that's all he did. Mm. But forever, he is part of Red Sox lore. And tonight, when he's introduced, he's going to get a standing ovation from the fans at Fenway Park. (laughs) But it's funny how basically that pinch-running appearance 
is all he ever did in a Red Sox uniform, but it was more than enough. So, so then I guess it's only fitting that will be the, the only cheers he gets for the entire World Series when he's in Boston. <laughs> Well, that's what he said to me yesterday. He said they're going to give me a standing ovation, or at least I hope so, uh, when it starts. And then after that, I'm the enemy, and that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern, on Audience.